Graduation Sunday. Oh, look at you guys waiting on me to get out of the way. Why didn't you just push me? Because you're a big guy. Oh, I'm not. He always tells me I'm big, and I'm like, I'll take it. He's big. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 13. Graduation weekend. We all get to go back to our day of graduating, whatever it was. Some of us didn't graduate. Some of us, some of us graduated right into life. But I think today's message is something that for all the graduates that are here, high school, college, maybe you're going from the first grade to the second grade, the fifth grade to the sixth grade, wherever you're at, I want to stop and pause and talk to you about one of my favorite parables of all time. Now, if you're looking at your watch and you're going, oh my gosh, we are never getting out of here. The louder you get, the quicker this message gets over. <laughs> so if, if you're loud, man, I can preach fast. But if you start answering your phone and start sleeping through this message, I'm just gonna point out details in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Spanish <laughs> and the German. But today, I'd like to start off and show you one of my most favorite parables of all time. This is Jesus. He's talking to us, and he's explaining how his dad's kingdom works. Listen closely. It's a short little awesome illustration, and it says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let's read it again. Again, <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Holy Spirit, open ears that can't be opened. Turn on hearts that have been dead for years. Remove calluses that have just built up a layer between us and you. And reveal your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me tell you that when we talk about graduation, Generally, the thing that happens is people begin to talk about living your dreams. Yeah. Maybe you would love to talk about your dreams and your purpose and your plan, all the things that is in your heart to do. And maybe some of your favorite scriptures to memorize is the ones that really kind of point out the hint towards, and God will give you the desires of your heart. It sounds something like that. But we tend to kind of cut verses up and only read the parts we want to, but we don't stop and look at the central most important figure about us, this is about us, is that this is not about you. We covered this a couple weeks ago. This is not about you. And if we're gonna talk about graduation, I think one of the most inappropriate messages in church is about me living my dreams. Can I tell you about my dreams? They've always been great, they've always been big but they've never been as big as God's, they've never been as great as God's, and my dreams only caused pain and hurt and jealousy and anger and mad because it wouldn't happen fast enough, it caused frustration, but when I began to live for the kingdom of God and I began to allow God to show me his plans for my life and his purpose, and remember I'm talking to you too, all of a sudden I began to realize it's okay to root for the other guy next to me because we're on the same team. Right. He's a brother in the Lord, I'm a brother in the Lord. You know how fun it is to wake up on Sunday morning and actually pray for the church down the road yeah. instead of be competitive against the church down the road? Yeah. You know how cool it is to think that it's no longer about me anymore, but it's about his kingdom. I prayed an aw awesome, awful prayer the other day. It was beautiful and brutal at the same time. It was brutal. And I was in my office and I just felt the presence of God and I just began to just shout and yell and, and, and celebrate. God, I pray if this weekend we win the whole world to Jesus just so that no one shows up at Cowboy Junction but they all show up at other churches, 
I think it's the coolest thing in the whole world. So let, I pray this weekend, no one shows up at Cowboy Junction. Everybody shows up at all the other churches. The whole world gets saved and then you come back and we get to go home. Yeah. Oh, you're clapping, but my church would have been empty. <laughs> when was the last time we stopped and we truly asked, are we praying for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done? When was the last time we really thought, it isn't about me, it's not about me, it's not about me, but it is about his kingdom. What does it mean, this kingdom of God? I really encourage you to look at it. Maybe you're in the room today and you're struggling, you're hurting, your heart's hurting, you're in a lot of pain right now. Maybe, maybe mentally you're just, you don't know where you're at. You came here today because it may be the, your last shot. And then in my first part of the message, you're sitting here going, gosh, why did I have to come today? One more time, a church that's not gonna help me get over my anxiety, help me get over my, my, my worry, help me get over my, my, my inability to live a successful life. I've got so many things consuming me. I'm addicted to so many things. Why can't I find a church that can straighten me out? Do you realize that in the first five minutes of this message, I've told you enough to find the greatest joy you'll ever find in your entire life? It's not about you. But one of the first lessons in finding the kingdom of God is recognizing it's not your authority over your life. It's laying your authority at the feet of God and placing him as the authority of your life. So today I'm not gonna talk to you graduates about living your dream. In fact, I just kinda hope you never live a dream. I hope you allow God to show you his dreams and his plans because at the end of your life, you can gain the whole world, but lose your soul. And that's the beautiful part about the ones that have finally figured it out. It is about his kingdom. Now let me just tell you, this hadn't been an easy journey for me. I don't know if you guys remember all our graduates, you were way too young to remember the Tim Tebow days, but those were fun days. We didn't even know where the Florida Gators were, but when Tim Tebow was playing, we all bought the jerseys and we all watched to see how, uh, how well he played and what he did. But there was an interesting conversation take place when a lady by the name of Rosie O'Donnell asked a great question on TV. Now don't boo, hush. She asked a great question. She was sitting on a panel of, of people that showed up every morning on this TV show, and she just asked a really important question to the Christian who was on the panel. And she turned and said, I don't get why Christians always thank God for victories after the championship. Now that kind of bugged the little Christian girl that was on the panel. And she said, why shouldn't we give God the glory? Why shouldn't we honor God? Why shouldn't Tim Tebow, Tebow say, I just want to give God all the glory. I just want to give God all the glory. T Rosie O'Donnell said, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you Christians that always thank God for victories. But what about the guys on the other team that were Christians who asked God to help them win? And they lost the championship. <coughs> so who does, God, who, who does God give wishes to? Who does God give the victories to? And Rosie asked a question that so many Christians got mad at because you weren't supposed to ask those kinds of questions. Because in our mind, we were still thinking God gives us championships and only good people win. Wow. And what if I turned to you and said, the kingdom of God has nothing to do with you winning championships. It has nothing to do with you losing championships either. The kingdom of God is revealed whether you win or lose. Now, for anybody in the room that your daddy's taught you, we win in this house. Let me just stop you. Keep, let me just stop you. Keep winning. I love winning. In fact, if you ever invite me to your high school baseball game, you better win. <laughs> I've came, I came to cheer for a winner. But can I be honest with you as a pastor? Whether you win or lose, it doesn't change my love for you. Whether you win or lose doesn't change the fact that I'm glad I'm your pastor. Whether you win or lose, it doesn't change the fact that it's, I'm gonna wake up the next morning and I'm gonna eat a bowl of cereal and your loss isn't gonna affect my honey bunches of oats one bit. It doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I don't mourn. It means, do you realize that life goes on? 
And one of the things that we've got to realize is Rosie's question was absolutely wonderful. We think it's all about us and our winnings and our championship, but the kingdom of God is revealed in the circumstances that we go through. So the real test isn't who are you when you win. The real test is what's revealed when you lose. And then I'll jump back on the winning because not all winners point to God after they give God the glory, they go live like the devil. Oh, that'll preach right there. Oh, I'm just getting started, you guys. <laughs> and it got really quiet on that part too in this, in this room. Let me break it down in the Greek, Hebrew, and Hispanic. Okay, here we go. All right. See, the truth is, we're all getting our cage rocked today. Because you've actually thought in your mind when you were losing, God must not like me. God must be against me. Eh, is that how your faith works? My pastor, Pastor Tommy Barnett, long time ago, used to stand up and he'd preach on his tippy toes. And he'd preach to us like this. And he'd walk back down and he'd preach on his tippy toes like this. I never will forget being a young man. He turned and he says, some of your faith is just the, 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 the flakiest thing I've ever seen. Some of you hop in your car and you go, God's on the throne, he got me a new vehicle. And then you drive down the road, you blow a tire, and you go, God's off the throne because I blew my tire. <laughs> but then a friend pulls over and sees, I blew your tire, you blew your tire. I happen to have a spare, and you go, oh, God's on the throne again, he's got a spare. But then your friend turns to you and says, hey, I don't have any gas, and I don't have any money, think you can go put $20 in my tank, and you go, God's off the throne again. That new tire cost me $20. <laughs> you have a faith that's on again and off again, and on again and off again. It's this little dance I'm doing, it's a good thing I'll go to CrossFit. <laughs> and Tommy Barnett, my pastor, turned to us and said, I pray for the day that you finally grow up and realize that you're Identity in the kingdom of God has nothing to do about things going right or things going wrong, but revealing his kingdom in whatever happens in your life. That's the test of faith. I never forgot this. It was so great. Here in this story of Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, can we put it back up on the screen again? It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure uh, hidden in the field, which a man found and hid for joy over it. And he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Let me tell you the story behind the story here. There is a man who happens to be walking along in Lee County, New Mexico. He's walking down College Lane and he cuts across the field over there by the Tuttle's house at the end to go to the town and country down the road. And he, as he's crossing the field, he looks down and finds a gold coin. He stops and he looks around, and he looks and he digs and he finds another gold coin. Instead of picking up all the gold coins, he puts it back and he covers it up. He runs and he gets a ride to home. He gathers everything that he has and he sells everything. Golf clubs, razors, cars, old CDs of Def Leppard. <laughs> and he gathers all of his money and he goes up and he knocks on the door. And he says, who owns this piece of property? The person says, well, I do. He says, what would you sell it for today for cash? And an offer is made and a transaction takes place and the person sells everything he has to buy a piece of property that has a treasure that he knows is there. And it's then when he owns the piece of property, signs the titles, the title goes into his hand. He is the official owner of a new parcel of land. It's then and only then that he runs out with a shovel and where he found two gold coins, he actually begins to dig and finds that it's not just two gold coins. It's an entire treasure, just like he knew was there. Now let me give you the human version of what us suckers would have done until today's message. <laughs> you would have gone back in the middle of the night when nobody was looking with a lamp on your head and you would have dug it all up. And the problem is, is that this is not how you do right things. 
And this story is a story about recognizing where there's treasure and paying whatever price you have to pay to get the thing that you know is there. And in this case, it translates to the kingdom of God, God's best, God's plan, God's purpose. This story, as much as we want to say, is about us. And God's telling me that I should pay the price. This story at first has nothing to do with you, except, let me show you, it's about Jesus. Let me show you again. It's a man who's walking through a field, finds a treasure, pays a price of everything he has to purchase the field and then own the treasure. This is the story of Jesus Christ. Why? Jesus is the man in the story. Think about it for a minute. You and I are the treasure. Did we sell anything to receive our salvation? Did we work to get our salvation? Is there anything that we could do to earn our salvation? No. But Jesus gave his life and paid the ultimate purchase price to rescue us who is, our, who is his treasure. And why do I wanna point that out first? Because this is Jesus' way of saying, you are my treasure. And I will give my life, as you will see. And from this moment on, I will lead you by example. To expect the thing out, same thing out of you for the things that my Father wants to do in you. Let me be very clear. Are you ready? If you want God's treasure... There are things you have to lay down to receive it. Now you may go, this is unfair. Oh, come on, you live by this every day. You let go of something to receive something else. Bob Goff, one of my favorite authors says, he quits something every day. Now some of you aren't very good quitters. You were raised to not be a quitter. Heather came out a minute ago and taught us how to let go. You know, a couple weeks ago, or last week, week before last, two weeks ago, how to let go. It's very important for us to let things go. You know why? Because the only way we'll ever be able to receive something is when we learn how to let things go. And when we learn how to stop and pause and realize that the treasure of God is gonna require us to let some things go, there's a lesson in this parable we've got to lean into. Let me give you four things. Four things that I think is so important in this parable and what it teaches us. Number one, God's kingdom is available to everyone. Now you may say life's unfair. How come it is that this guy found the gold coin? Trust me. Do you not think that your Father in heaven has treasures beyond what we can ever think or imagine? There is treasures that is all around you, things that he wants to show you, reveal to you. There is things that can bring joy to your family, peace in your family. There are things that can bring prosperity and, and, and great things that actually point towards God. Where It's an amazing witnessing tool. When people turn to you and say, come on, you're not the same guy you used to be. When we were growing up in high school, that guy I never thought would live past his 20s, but here you are, and, and what happened in your life? And you see this treasure that you started pursuing, and he sees the treasure that you have, the peace that's in your family, the love that's in your family, the purpose that's in your family, and in this moment, you're able to turn as a witnessing tool, say, dude, it's not me. And even though my church is awesome and my pastor rocks, it has nothing to do about these guys. It has everything to do with what God did in my life, and I would like to tell you what he can do in your life too. It's this beautiful story that God begins to show us that God's kingdom is available for everyone. And this parable is him showing, this is my story, and this is me being an example to you as well. And what we've got to do is be people who, number two, see the treasure. You've got to be treasure hunters, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And in treasure hunting, can I be honest with you? 
Some of us don't value what God values. And some of us really have a worldly treasure system. And for us to really know God's plans, we've gotta be able to see the things of God that we might even think is impossible. It's impossible, that could never work in my family. That's impossible, I could never do that. That's impossible, that's impossible. But it's not impossible. The, the, the story doesn't say that he immediately dug it up. The story says that he saw it and then had to ask himself if he was really gonna go after it. And yet it's a wrestle that takes place in every one of our life too. Come on, don't let me lose you now. One of the biggest issues going on with you is not what you don't have, but it's actually about what you don't want. It's not what you don't have, and you think I don't have this, I don't have this, or if I had that, if I had that. It's not what you don't have, it's what you're not wanting. And if we could be chasers after the kingdom of God, if we could grow a taste for the things of God, if we could start looking at something as simple as authority and asking ourselves, am I the authority over my life or have I put the authority in God's hands? It would cause us to change the entire system of what we value and what we treasure. And I wanna encourage you, we gotta be treasure hunters. And when we begin to move in God's spirit and want what God wants and see his treasure and desire it, all of a sudden you can just spot it everywhere. You may tell you some treasures in my life, people have become treasure. Oh yeah, that sounds so corny. But can I tell you a long time ago, man, I could care less. It was all about me. I truly have had change of heart in that in my life I can honestly say, People matter to God, and so if they matter to God, they matter to me. I might not even know you, but you matter to me. I might see you on the streets, but you matter to me. And the whole reason people have found value in my life is because God values people. So, so cool. God values love, and I don't mean the fake kind of love. I mean love that's patient and kind. I have to go down the list of the 1 Corinthians chapter 13 list of what is love several times in my life, in my day, to make sure that I am actually practicing the love that love is because God values that and not just being sloppy love. These are all the things you begin to treasure. God's kingdom is available to everyone. We've gotta start seeing the treasure and then, this one's thrown in there. We have to be people of character. Now, <clears throat> there's gonna be some things that God turns to you and puts in your heart. I want you to win championships. I want you to build businesses. But in the process of getting to where God wants us to be, we're gonna do it God's way. And in your life, you're gonna notice that there are, there are shortcuts. There really are. In the story, the young man could have gone back in the middle of the night, dug up the, the, the treasure, taken it, but it never would have been his. It always would have been stolen. Okay. In fact, probably when we were reading the parable and I made a big deal about, hey, he hid it. You're thinking, man, what, what, did, he, what did he hide it for? It's there. No one knows it's there. The landowner doesn't know it's there. It was put there long before he even bought the land. God's trying to show me, here it is. Can I tell you that there's a lot of God things that young people and people are doing the privileges that come after the commitment before the commitment. There are privileges that we want before we actually pay the price. And we've gotta stop and think. We can even do a God thing the wrong way. Come on, y'all gonna have to have ears to hear and hearts to receive on this one. I'm not going into detail. Do you see the finish line, but you know where the shortcuts are? And you don't have a problem giving God the glory. God, I, I, when I get here, when we get here, I'm gonna give you the glory. But on the inside, 
we didn't do the process God's way. There's gonna be school that's not the finish line, it's the process. There's gonna be marriage, it's not the finish line, it's the process. It's not, I tell you what, ministry even has a cheap way of doing it too. Yeah. I, anybody can preach. Heck, can I just tell you, anybody can. You know what you need to do? Have internet. I'm serious. Have internet. You could download messages and preach it just like Furtick. But where God says, hey, listen, I love Furtick. Kid rocks. Well, not kid rocks, but the kid rocks. <laughs> but you know who rocks too is you do. And he preaches like he preaches because he's been with me. Don't preach like him because you heard him. Or don't preach like him because you downloaded him. I want you to spend time with me. And when your words come out, you will know without a shadow of a doubt they weren't Furtick's words. They were my words. Now some of you are still trying to figure out who Furtick is. Okay, He's the guy who learned how to preach probably one of the most profound preachers in, 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 in the United States right now. And I see so many young pastors trying to be Furtick. And I wanna take them and pull them aside and say, don't be Furtick. Be the person that God called you to be. Is anybody getting anything out of today? One last point. See, God's kingdom is available to everyone. We gotta see the treasure. We gotta be a person of character, but there is a cost. You will have to choose the treasure, God's treasure, but you will have to lay something down. In my own life, <clears throat> to go to ministry school, I had to quit college. In order to become a pastor, I had to give up being an evangelist. <clears throat> In order to become debt free, I had to give up selfish spending. Every time God moved me into his plan, there was always something that I had to give up. And I wanna ask you this, what do you value more? God's plan or your treasure? And I wanna turn and say, there is a cost and I would encourage you to pay it. Whatever you have to do to stay in purity, whatever you have to do to stay in plan, Whatever you have to do to stay in kingdom, whatever you have to do to think the thoughts God thinks, whatever you have to do, you're gonna have to say a hundred no's for every one God yes in your life. Your no's have to be just as powerful as your yeses. But the cost is worth it. Yeah. Let me give you today's water cooler moment. Water cooler moment is this moment in our church service where if you forget <coughs> everything you forget the scripture you forget the four points you forget everything but you remember this water cooler moment someone can be at a water cooler at work tomorrow and they say hey what pastor Ty preached on yesterday and if you remember this you remember everything okay here's where I, here we go you ready here's what our water cooler moment went, is whatever is lost in pursuit of the kingdom of heaven is a small price to pay considering the value of what is gained. The worship team's coming up. And while they do, let, let, me, throw, let me throw a little tension in the room. Can, can I be honest with you? Not everybody can do that. Now, it's not just me saying this. In Matthew chapter 19, there is this moment where a rich young man comes up to Jesus. Let me read it to you. It's not gonna show up on the screen, but he walks up to Jesus and he says, hey, I wanna follow you. What must I do? What must I do 
And Jesus begins to say, well, do this and do this. And he said, well, I've already done that. Jesus said, well, good, well, then do this and do this. He says, I did that too. And he turns and he says, okay, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. This is the big ask. Come follow me, Jesus says. Anybody in the room want to follow Jesus? I mean, that's why we're here, right? I want to follow Jesus. But the young man couldn't sell everything he had. And let me tell you what it says. It says that the young man heard what was said, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions, and he couldn't let them go. Don't be that guy. Because when we look at what we have, and we think, I can't let it go, we're not seeing all that's around us. We've got our eyes focused on the wrong thing. So, Jesus turned to his disciples, and I want you to look at what Jesus says. Assuredly, I say to you, that it's hard for a rich man, for a distracted man, for a guy who has his own treasure to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not even because they're bad people. It's that they don't want what God has. So his disciples pulled him away <coughs> and asked a great question. Look at the question the disciples asked. Okay, Lord, then <coughs> who can be saved? <coughs> I mean, my goodness. Do any of us have a chance? Maybe you're here today and you're asking that question too. It's a great message. But what do I have to do now? Just go sell my house? Sell my cars? Walk around in a sackcloth and ash? Where's the limit? Where's the line? Great question. It's exactly what they asked. And Jesus gives an answer that is so perfect. And it's perfect for you and it was perfect for them. And it's this answer that you just keep unpacking. And it says this. Jesus says, hey guys, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let me tell you what Jesus is saying here. If you try to think about how to do kingdom things with a man's thinking, you'll never figure it out. Several weeks ago, we did a series called Weird. And it was showing us how normal is something we've always prided us, ourselves in. But normal destroyed our life. Weird offended me. And if you would have called me weird, I would have thought, I don't like you. But when I started following Jesus, my life looked weird to normal people. But the weirdness of following Jesus has brought the greatest joy in my life. And in my life, I can honestly say that if I tried to figure out God's ways with my thinking, it would have never worked. It would have been possible. So what do you do? What do you do? You just simply keep showing up and you keep asking God, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do today? And just like an onion, the Holy Spirit will just keep unraveling things in your life. And things that once seemed impossible will become normal because the kingdom of God has become that real in your life. Just keep showing up. Just keep showing up. Just keep showing up. There you go, a couple of people did it, a couple of people, yeah. <clears throat> Three things, Oswald Chambers says this. He says, if you're in the struggle, don't debate God. Get out of the rhythm of debating God, get out of the rhythm of constantly saying, but God, but God, but God, but God. If you're in the struggle, stop 
debating God. Number two, Oswald Chambers in, in, in his book, the, uh, let me get it right, The Utmost for His Highest, he says you've got to condition your life to just keep pursuing God. Just keep showing up. We don't debate with God, we don't, and, and we've got to condition our life. But then he says this, he says, our circumstances reveal the Jesus in us. Pay the price. You're going to face giants. But everyone's going to know that you can't beat the giant. But when the giant is defeated, you will be able to say, it wasn't me who defeated the giant, but it was God who defeated the giant. You will cross seas, you will see walls fall, but it will be because you were about his kingdom, not about your kingdom. We're going to take a leap of faith as a church next week. And next week, we're going to plant our very first church ever at Cowboy Junction. It's a pucker moment for this church and this pastor. You know what a pucker moment is? Is when you just go, ooh, God, this hurts. Nobody thought that was funny. Oh, God, it hurts. But it's kingdom. And we want to honor and bless his kingdom. I want you to go this week and I want you to pray and seek God and ask him, what do you want our family to do? And as an entire community, body of Christ at Cowboy Junction, we're going to accumulate our offering and write the rescue church in Austin. A check. It's where it can relieve some of the pressures of being a startup church. But I want to turn to you for everybody that's maybe watching online or here today. It would say, I'm not even living for God. I don't even know God. I got an idea. Why don't you start with something right now? What would it look like? You ready? Well, it looked like this for me a long time ago. I had to really ask, who's the authority over my life? Who's the Lord over my life? And in all intents and purposes, I was the master of my house. And that was normal. But Jesus was saying, How's it working for you? And it wasn't. And as a teenager, I was, I was going down a path that was going to lead to death. And he grabbed my heart and he said, if you'll exchange your authority for my authority, if you make me the Lord of your life, see if I won't lead you better than you ever led yourself. See if I won't lead you to life and life abundantly to peace that passes all understanding, purpose like you've never known, purpose that is in my kingdom. And folks, if you were to ask, how did I get here? It was because I realized that I was not doing a good job mastering my life. And I needed a master. And I chose Jesus. Here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. We're going to sing a song. The worship team's going to play and we're going to honor God and we're going to pray. And the prayer team's going to come up here. And if you need any prayer, they would love to pray with you. Just get out of your seat and come up here and our prayer team would love to pray with you. But maybe you're in this room and you've been trying to master your life and you're not doing a very good job. It's because you were never, never made to be the master of your life. You were created in the image of God and His workmanship. You were created to be a son and a daughter and sin has separated us from God and you need a chance to do it right again. And so here's what I'm going to offer you. When everybody's worshiping in here, I'm going to sneak out. I'm going to go right out those doors and I'm going to go to the Jesus sign back there. And if you're in this room and you're ready to hand authority over to Jesus, 
in exchange for his authority over your life in love and kindness and fatherhood like you've never known before. You would be crazy to leave the same way you came in. Don't you want something different? And your heart's beating out of your chest because you know this is exactly what you're supposed to do in your life. So here's what we're gonna do. Everybody stand to your feet. We're gonna worship. If you need prayer, come to the front. The prayer team would love to pray with you. But if you are ready to exchange your authority over your life for God's authority, and you wanna leave this place different than you've ever been in your life, and everything inside of your chest is telling you, you know he's talking to you, you know he's talking to you. Lose your pride, you know he's talking to you. Where do you think we're gonna be in 10 years? Where do you think our decisions are gonna get us in 10 years? This is our chance to finally know God's plan for our life. He's right. We need God's authority in our life. And if you would like to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I just want you to reach over, grab your stuff, look at the people who you came with, said, would you guys give me five minutes, just five minutes, and I want you to move out of the aisles. I want you to go right out the back, those double doors. Just grab your stuff. And I'm going to be standing by the Jesus sign. And you walk up. I want you to say these words to me. Pastor Ty, I'm ready to follow Jesus. And I'll know exactly who you are. I'll know exactly who you are. And today you will leave a different person than how you walked in. So right now, you ready? Grab your stuff. The rest of y'all, you're going to sing and get ready for a new treasure to be revealed and you're gonna pursue it with all of your heart. Come on, I'll meet you at the Jesus sign.